Good morning, everyone. Um, because I, I, I didn't get a verbal uh, feedback last time, uh, I thought I'll just set up a, um, an online uh, feedback. Um, it just takes you one minute, and you can use this um, QR code. If I can get my mouse pointer on it. Um, to access it, or you can go to classtime.com and then put this um, code when asked, and you can you can um, give a random name if they ask for a student name if you want to be anonymous. Uh, and it'll just take you one minute. You can do it um, uh, whenever you want, and I'll I'll put this link up again um, at the end of the class. So this is just to know um, uh, get know what you thought about the lecture and get some feedback on it. All right, so before we um, start with place cells again, um, can anybody or can you um, summarize what we learned in the last class? Just very broadly, what did we learn in the last class? Anybody? We learn about different migrations. Right. That's correct. What else did we learn? Think of what was your take home message. It always helps to, every, for every lecture, it always helps to like remember before you uh, start with the, the lecture, it helps to remember what you learned in the last class. So it kind of stays um, 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 in your memory. Um, yeah, what else did you, uh, Done. Like what was most memorable about the lecture? We learned about the benefits and drawbacks of migration. That is correct. Yeah, benefits and, and costs and benefits of uh, migration. We learned about different types of mig migration. What else did you learn? Right, mechanisms of uh, uh, navigation uh, that are used for migration. Uh, is there anybody anybody else? Is there anything that they missed? Yeah. All right. Differences between migration and dispersal. Right. Uh, differences and, and definitions of migration and dispersal. Um, all good points. Um, thank you. And um, let's start with uh, uh, place cells again. So uh, that's where we, we stopped last time. Uh, does anybody want to define what place cells are? Do you know what place cells are from our last lecture? What, what are place cells? They, they give you directional uh, cues uh, in your memory for where, you know, which way to go. Like you could remember which direction things were, no, or where you. But were. not exactly uh, uh, accurate. Uh, they don't necessarily give you direction. They just tell you these are neurons. Place cells are neurons in the hippocampus region of the brain, uh, of mammalian brain uh, or, or vertebrate brain. Um, and these neurons, th there may be a, a few thousand of them, and each of them fire when they're in when the animal is in a particular place in its environment. Does that, um, is that clear to everyone? So for example, if you see this rat and this is its environment, this uh, arena there, and, and they're recording, uh, so you can record the neuronal activity using electrodes, as you can see here, uh, and, and the mouse can just uh, navigate in its, move around in its uh, uh, environment. And then they're recording uh, the activity of 10 place cells, right? So the, like I mentioned, so each of these colored place cells get activated when, when the animal is in a particular position in the environment, right? And so if you look at this, um, so, so the, each dot is an activity of the, of, the new, uh, of the place cell. And so this particular place cell, the yellow colored place cell is active it fires only when the uh, animal is in that area of the room, right? And similarly, the red ones uh, fire when the, uh, the rat is in this area of, of the room, right? So that way you kind of uh, get, so the animal gets a 
mental map of what its environment looks like. Is that clear? Well, would those also be connected to memory? So if it, there was some significant aspect of the environment in a certain location, the fact that he was, it was in, you know, it would associate that, let's say food or whatever. Yes, it, it is. It so is. To help it give direction. Yes, it is likely that it, it, uh, it, it may be connected to memory and learning uh, centers as well. I don't exactly know the exact um, um, like wiring uh, connections between play cells and other, other neurons, but I would imagine um, they might be connected to say, yeah, so this is the place I found food. And so maybe you get associations uh, with food with that place. Um, yeah. Uh, and other people, is the idea of uh, play cells clear to you? Uh, yes or no? People on the Zoom. Uh, you can say no, you can repeat it. All right, awkward silence it is then. You got, what about you guys? Do you get the idea of play cells, kind of? Exactly, exactly. That's that's yeah. That's that's exactly what um, uh, I'm trying to uh, explain uh, in terms of play cells. So these are neurons that will help you uh, um, know the position, uh, your, your position in an environment. And so suppose I put, I take this rat and put it in another room. Now all the, um, uh, the neuronal cells are assigned to different places in that particular um, uh, environment, right? And so these are environment specific. So in each environment, uh, each of these new uh, place cells Sig uh, signify or they get uh, fired or activated when they're in a particular position in that environment. All right. Um, so this is a very uh, important study uh, and because, uh, and it won a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2014. Um, so, th so this is exactly what I was trying to say when, when an animal explores. Here they have shown one place cell and, and it's always active when the animal is in, in this particular position. Um, and and the, the, uh, the Nobel Prize was uh, shared with uh, two other scientists who studied something called great cells. They're, they're similar neurons, but they're in the enterohenal cortex uh, region of the brain. And um, so these neurons, this is one activity of one neuron here. So it, they fire in, in, in a pattern of a grid to sort of give them like a coordinate uh, system uh, um, when they're navigating. Um, all right, so these are examples of uh, two-dimensional um, uh, play cells. And obviously um, uh, scientists wanted to understand whether it, there are play cells that show three-dimensional position as well. And so one of the, um, uh, suitable animals to study this uh, are bats, they fly around and you can insert electrodes um, um, uh, in, their, in their play cells and to see, uh, to quantify where each of the play cells uh, get activated when the bat is flying. And so sure enough, they find similar kind of play cells. So these are different play cells activities that are activated. So when the rat is in this position, play cell, pink colored play cell, well, the play cell itself is not pink, it's just denoted pink here. Uh, this, this particular play cell is activated when, when the rat is here and a different play cell is activated and so on. And the same is true when, when the animal is flying um, in three-dimensional space as well. And do humans have these? Um, I'm gonna show you uh, 
a picture of a human brain in surgery. If you don't want to look at it, you can look away um, for a while. Um, all right, so that's a human brain uh, under neurosurgery. And so this is a patient who volunteered uh, to participate in this experiment uh, during his, uh, his or her um, neurosurgery. Uh, and, and so these are the electrodes that are inserted into the hippocampus region of the brain um, uh, where the place cells are. And, and, and remember, the brain, brain doesn't have uh, pain sensors. So they, the patient doesn't really feel um, the pain. And the patient is awake during this uh, experiment as well. And the patient has um, um, virtual reality goggles on. And so he or she is uh, navigating in virtual space. And then, and then you record how the play cells are uh, activated um, when, the, when the person is in different places uh, inside the virtual reality. And sure enough, you find that you find that for each of the places inside the virtual reality arena, uh, virtual uh, world, uh, there are different play cells that get activated, right? And that kind of gives them uh, a mental map of what the, um, the environment is like. For example, I'm here in this building uh, uh, in FIU, but if, I've, uh, if I know some of these buildings, I kind of have a mental map of where I am uh, with respect to say a library, uh, the, the library building. Um, and so uh, one place cell, one particular place cell might be active when I'm here. And when I need to think of uh, ways to get here um, and, and a, a different place cell that shows that particular place might be activated. All right. So those were uh, uh, the, some of the proximate mechanisms of navigation. Uh, so we talked about migration, we talked about costs and benefits of migration. Uh, we defined migration. Um, and then we talked about how do animals know when to migrate. Uh, and then we went, to, went into the details of um, uh, mechanisms of migration and navigation in different animals, including um, um, understanding how they use different cues like magnetic field, um, or sun's position or the polarized light um, and how an animal knows where uh, it, uh, it is in, in, uh, with respect to uh, its environment. Uh, and we also learned that the uh, same animal can use many uh, different cues during uh, navigation and sometimes simultaneously and sometimes um, separately. Um, so here you can see an example of using um, Earth's magnetic field and sun's position and then at the same time, uh, for close range, you can use smells and highways or visual landmarks uh, to navigate. All right, so before we move on to the territoriality part, are there any questions about uh, migration? Yeah, Ravi? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, migration doesn't really have to be periodic or temporary. I mean, it could result in permanent, like if they happen to find some location, at least part of the population may just re move to that area and stay there. And yeah, well, the there way would be a migration and not it instead would be, of it would be dispersal in that case. If they're just well, staying there, it would be dispersal. I thought dispersal, but dispersal means like going away because of, okay, to select against interbreeding or a scarcity of food. Well, I'm just saying that sometimes the migration, I would imagine, has resulted in populations populating someplace along the migration route. Some yeah. decided to go back and some decided to stay. Like some well, people well, come to Florida for a vacation and they don't go back to New York. <laughs> but yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's a human example. Again, uh, it's well, much I was just complex and that. Yeah. yeah, much more complex. And that's why I didn't want to get into it. Uh, but, uh, but to answer that, um, well, um, they are migrating for a reason. So they're migrating, they're, remember there are costs associated with it. You're migrating for say a resource and then the resource gets depleted as uh, over time with, with season, with changing seasons, for example. And there's no point for you to stay in that place and you would migrate back again. 
And yeah. so typically, if that's the goal, if they're trying to maximize their benefits, it doesn't uh, necessarily make sense to them unless the benefits of staying there outweigh the cost. And so typically, when they're doing it, it's seasonal, and, and then they have um, um, seasonal, seasonal variation, spatial temporal variation in um, uh, resource availability. Yeah. Did anybody else have any question? Uh, yeah, so you, you're saying that that experiment you just showed us with the guy with his brain, that guy was basically awake during that entire thing? Yes. He was walking around? No, he was not. That's, that's the, yeah, that's the reason they used virtual space. So he was oh, on, he on walking yeah, on virtual space. He was just like kind of sitting there, but the virtual space, like moving in it, yeah. still off the place receptors. Yes, so you don't necessarily have to have more. That's a good question. You don't necessarily have to have motion uh, in order to activate the plus cells. Like just like the so movement. Right, so you have your virtual goggles on and you're actually uh, moving inside the virtual reality, say using a mouse pointer or, or um, some sort of motion that lets you uh, navigate um, uh, in the virtual space. And you can still find that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and then the patient is actually uh, lying on, on, on a surgery uh, bed. Yeah. Any, any other questions? All right, so let's move on to territoriality. Uh, all right, so animals typically tend to select the habitats that they live in. They actively choose where to live uh, and that, uh, gives rise to home ranges for different animals, which are just um, uh, places where the animal, the individual spend most of their lives. And, and these home ranges could include nests or feeding ranges. Um, and they're typically undefended and they can be held by either males or females. And the size of these home ranges could change over time depending on the availability of resources and so on. Um, and there's something called ideal free distribution uh, theory as well, which uh, states that individuals distribute themselves among the resource patches in order to max minimize competition and maximize fitness. And so uh, in order to minimize competition, sometimes some animals might have to occupy less favorable sites, right? And so an example is how, if you consider food as, as a resource, how different um, ducks uh, distribute themselves um, in a pond depending on the availability of food um, um, or it could it could also be mates or a different um, in a different example um, so what what the theory says basically is that if patch a contains more resources than patch b there'll be more number of individuals in patch a compared to patch b all right, so I'll, I'll show you a uh, uh, demonstration of this. So here you can see two people, the left person has more food uh, and then the right person has less food. And they have made these uh, demarcations into two areas. And so they, they throw the food and then they wait for the birds to um, come and forage. And uh, notice what happens with the number of uh, birds in each of the uh, uh, areas. And notice what else happens, and I'll ask you um, to tell me. All right, so can anybody tell me what happened over time? What did you observe there? What did you observe? 
Remember the left side person uh, put more food in the left side uh, area and the right side had less food. Are these the birds looking for the uh, horseshoe crab eggs? I don't or is know. that something different? I don't know. Uh, for, for the sake of this experiment, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So based on one side having less food and the other one having more food, I noticed that the birds stayed the same amount of time on each side even though one had less and was okay. consumed fairly quicker, I would assume, than the other side that had more food. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I don't know the exact amount of time, but uh, yeah, uh, that's likely. What else do you see with respect to numbers? Number of birds over time. Yeah, some animals move from the left side to the right side. And what's the initial number of birds like? What was the initial number of birds that came to the left side versus right side? Was it more number of birds in the left side compared to the right side? Did anybody, did anybody else notice that? I uh, didn't. All right. Uh, Looks like the there was a majority on the left, and then eventually a majority moved to the right. Okay, so exactly. So yeah. the majority of them explored the the left side one because it had more uh, amount of food, uh, and then the right side uh, ha had fewer of them. So if you notice now, there's more of them in the left side compared to the right side, and then over time they get redistributed um, again. And then if you're really um, observant, you will also notice something else. Um, is that there are there were some pigeons as well. These are I think these are seagulls, uh, some species of seagulls. There were also some pigeons in the in the beginning um, as well. So that brings us to a point. So this is a theory that says that um, individuals distribute themselves among um, uh, resource patches depending on the the amount of uh, uh, resources in each of the patches. Uh, obviously, this doesn't apply to all the species. Some species do deviate, um, very few species actually follow this theory. Uh, tell me when do animals deviate from this theory? The clue was actually in there, the pigeons. That's one of the uh, reasons why, why animals might um, deviate from this theory. Huh? Anybody? Guess. Well, repeat it one more time. Um, so this theory is applicable to animals, but it may not also be ap applicable depending on uh, a few assumptions that of, of this uh, theory that fail. So one of the assumptions is that they know the quality of the patches. So if the animal doesn't know the quality, then, um, then this theory doesn't really apply. So they may not really distribute themselves uh, according to the size of the resources. Um, and then what's the other assumption that, uh, that, can, um, uh, uh, that can make the animals not follow this ideal pre-distribution theory? And the clue was the, the pigeons there. Did you, uh, were you trying to say something? Were the pigeons already basically, like, so if the pigeons are already there, then maybe they don't choose that patch because I don't know, like it's in use <laughs> or like they could probably find to get be better off in another patch alone. You're, you're getting there, you're close. So basically competition. So if the animals ha are, are highly competent, if there's uh, other species that are competing with the, with the particular uh, resource patch and if they're actively defending it, right? And so if an animal, uh, if there's a there's an um, dominant animal that doesn't let other animals uh, forage in that patch, then you wouldn't uh, get ideal pre-distribution. So you end up having one or, or, or a small group of individuals getting most of the resources. Yeah? And so you the animals wouldn't really uh, uh, separate themselves based on the amount of resources in that case. And that's one of the, one of the advantages of having territoriality. And that's what uh, um, uh, we're gonna discuss next, right? 
is, is, is that clear to everyone? How competition can actually um, change uh, how different animals distribute themselves to exploit a resource. Yeah, shall I move ahead? Yeah, so that, that has to do with like going to a less favorable thing of competition makes the the one yeah. with more food less favorable because of intraspecific competition and then the pigeons came to avoid interspecific competition against the dominant species. Uh, I don't know if I quite understood what you're trying to say, but, um, uh, but yeah, so if there is competition, uh, if I understood you correctly, if there is competition, then some individuals might end up having to like uh, settle for less um, resourceful patches. Basically, that's that's what it means. So the individuals might get less food. Basically. All right. Um, and so that uh, I I wanted to introduce uh, another uh, concept with uh, because we're talking about competition. There are two types of competitions that animals can have. Uh, the first one is uh, scramble competition and the second one is interference competition. Um, so here you can see uh, cows grazing in a, in a, in a grassland. Uh, and then these are impalas, in, uh, male impalas fighting uh, to get access to a female. Can you guess which one is scramble and which one is interference just by looking at, looking at them? Like what are the differences between these two kinds of competition? Sorry, impalas is interference. That's correct. What are the differences? How are how are these two competitions different? That's correct. Yeah, you're you're there. Um, so basically, cows are just uh, grazing. They're indirectly competing with each other. They can graze as much as they want, but. Um, so there are finite resources available to all the competitors in the case of uh, cows, and that's scramble competition. If the, the amount of resources decrease, um, all of them suffer basically, right? But in case of uh, interference competition, winners typically gain access to the resources. So whoever wins in this competition gets access to mate, for example, right? Uh, and a very uh, interesting example, another example of interference uh, competition is um, uh, of these two uh, desert ants, which you find them in, in uh, Arizona and, and uh, California. So they live in really high temperature areas and they have to be able to forage for seeds. They, they eat seeds uh, in the desert before it gets really hot. But what happens, because they're both competing for the same resource, what happens is that the first species, Novo Mesa um, uh, gets out of its nest in the morning and then goes to the nest entrances of this uh, particular species, Pogonomermis probatus, and then closes the nest entrances. Um, so what it does is that uh, when these guys, uh, when Pogonomermis wants to forage, it'll take them more time to dig up uh, the nest entrance and then get out and then and then forage. In the meantime, this particular species can go out and forage most of the seeds that are out there and then get back home before it gets too hot. But these guys are delayed um, from over to one one to one to three hours of foraging time. And so that's a that's an example of interference competition. So you're basically actively interfering so that the other animal doesn't get um, enough resources. Does that make it clear? Uh, I think I think some feedback would really help me uh, just say yes or no. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so um, that brings us to territories. Um, these are typically defended areas. You may be defending against one specific, which is the same species or other species. And so you, typically they include uh, the defended areas include resources or breeding areas. And that's why um, it's important to defend them. Um, can you tell me some reasons as to why animals defend their territories? Uh, maybe there's a resource there that they want for themselves, so they defend it, basically. That's correct, yeah, which you just uh, described. Um, what else? 
what else are the benefits of uh, territory that you have? Hunting grounds. Uh, hunting grounds, yeah, that's a good one. That was your point as well. Okay, great. Yeah, hunting grounds. And uh, mating for uh, protecting uh, their a female or having a female with a nest or cave or whatever they're mating right. to defend against uh, right. so you, somebody else taking their woman and mating. Right. So you're, you mate without interruption. So the availability of mate. And you get a choice. So females typically can uh, choose a suitable male based on the territorial defense fights, for example, or based on this, uh, the, the quality of territories that they hold. And it also reduces competition. So you're basically, all the resources that are in your territory are yours. Nobody else can compete with them. Uh, and you also have food and you get more space and it also avoids overcrowding. Um, and it also indirectly, did you have something? Um, and it, in the, it indirectly controls the population as well because the, the individuals that are more successful uh, in, um, in defending their territories would also be successful in producing more uh, offspring. Um, right, right, so now that we know why animals defend, how do they actually tell others that this is my territory? What are the ways that animals can um, defend, advertise their territories? That they defend. You have all the examples there. You can, you can, you would have to tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Scent. Yes, that's 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 one uh, one of the ways that animals def uh, advertise their territory. Scent, olfaction. What else? Laura. Facial expressions, visual uh, visual signals. Yeah, that's correct. What else? What are the other ways that animals can advertise? Sound. Sound. Yeah, that's 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 another uh, uh, one as well. So you kind of covered all the three that I had. Um, did anybody else have something to add? Coloration and ritualized displays. Of, uh, right, so this is visual signals again, coloration and visual signals. All right, um, so like we, uh, uh, like um, Leslie mentioned, um, a lot of animals use olfaction. So they, they advertise their territories using pheromones. So if you, if you own pets, you know that, that they, they really like lifting up their legs and marking their territories every time um, they find a pole or, or, or a garbage bin. Um, and similarly, you also um, have big cats. A lot of big cats use uh, pheromone uh, marks to, uh, to advertise their uh, territories and they actively patrol around their territories to defend any intruders as well. Uh, does anybody identify what this animal is? Does anybody know what this animal is in the corners? A wombat. A wombat. Um, and what, what is this? Uh, the wombat poop. That is wombat poop. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, that's another way animals can uh, defend the territory as well, defecation. So you might have uh, signals that tell you that this is my territory. Uh, and so one of the reasons why, um, one of the hypotheses rather, why their poop is a square shape is uh, thought to be because uh, if it is square shape, it, they typically live on uh, hilly areas. And if it's square shape, the, the poop doesn't roll down the hill. And so if it, and it'll stay in one place and it can clearly demarcate the territory. That's one of the hypotheses um, uh, that people have uh, proposed for why their poop is uh, like a cuboid shape. All right, so the other uh, way that you can, um, advertise is visual display. Um, you might have seen a lot of uh, examples of this. And this, the first one is a roughed grouse. And so it does a sort of a ritualized um, a territorial uh, display. And sometimes some of these territorial displays may be similar to their, or similar or same as their uh, mating displays as well. And that kind of uh, tells them, this is my, my territory uh, to the males, to other males, kinds of tells them uh, that it's my territory. And another, the second one is a very uh, common example that you see outside uh, in Florida, 
all the time in your gardens and on campus. Uh, these green lizards with their uh, uh, colorful uh, flaps that they often uh, open up to show their territory. And sim similarly, there are other colorful um, displays, uh, 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 for example, like this trill lizard that shows them, um, shows others that it's its territory and trying to defend it. Um, and can you tell me if you can display uh, using visual signals, why use other signals? If you can do pheromones and visual signals, if they work as good, why do animals use other kinds of uh, advertisements? To advertise in larger distances. That is correct, to advertise in larger distances. If you're uh, using um, visual signals, the animal or the other animal or the competitor needs to be near you. And if your territory is much larger, which is the case with a lot of animals, including birds, you need to be able to uh, vocalize it and, 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 and get your message across uh, to farther distance. And another advantage, can anybody think of another advantage of um, vocal signals? Can they sometimes like imitate another animal that might be more threatening? That is, yeah, that is, that is also correct. They can imitate uh, other animals. Um, there are actually uh, some animals um, that are, some birds that I know, they can imitate even the uh, people and the tourists clicking cameras, uh, uh, clicking pictures in their camera so they can um, imitate the shutter closing of the cameras as well. Um, yeah, so the other uh, advantage is that you can use them even when it's dark. So if, if it's dark, if you're, uh, you can use your visual signals only in the daytime when there's enough light, but you can use uh, vocalization at night time as well. So one of the examples is uh, this uh, woodpecker. So they, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a video from one of the documentaries and, and a woodpecker is trying to defend or advertise its territory. Oh wait, there's no volume. Um, So he's basically imitating the territorial call or territorial peck. You know, also in a dense area like a forest, you know, the visualizations are blocked by the trees and leaves and all that stuff. So right. penetrate yeah. through uh, blocked. Right. Um, all right. So there are other examples of vocalization as well. I think um, uh, uh, baboons are another example. You can see them make uh, noises and they move in really uh, uh, um, large or small uh, social groups and they all uh, actively defend their territory and then they use vocalization. And you can see a lot of birds, for example, like this red winged blackbird. Uh, and they are they perch on a high ground and then they they call out to advertise the territory. And right now, I think in spring you can see a lot of birds um, do these kind of uh, mating or was mating and or or territorial uh, vocalization in Florida as well. All right. So the other com uh, one of the common behaviors in territoriality is aggression. Uh, animals typically uh, show aggression to intimidate others and to defend their young and the resources uh, in their territory. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's an innate behavior that uh, the animals just um, have it uh, instinctively. Um, and, and another ways uh, uh, territoriality is uh, involved uh, with reproduction is uh, uh, something called uh, lex. So these are uh, communal, uh, display uh, um, uh, grounds. So basically there are some animals like uh, these uh, deer, um, like these ungulates, and there are some birds like sage grouse, where they get together in a, in a, in a common area and communally display uh, their dominant status and compete, uh, display uh, um, for, for uh, mates, display, sorry, the males basically display uh, uh, to gain access to females. 
right? And all of the males are in the same area and they're communally displaying and they're competing for a dominant status. And the most successful males occupy the central territories in the leg. And that means that um, one male, the successful male can actually mate with many, many females, right? And typically in this kind of uh, uh, mating system, uh, which involves uh, 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 central territories uh, and, 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 and display um, uh, behaviors, the animals do not form a lasting uh, pair bonding. They, the, the females just mate with, them, mate, mate with the males and then they, they probably don't see each other um, after that. And so this is uh, one of the ways that uh, territoriality and the dominance of uh, the most successful males um, um, is involved in the production. Uh, okay, before, yeah. Yeah, uh, can it also be a signal for dispersal if uh, there's too many in the, they see there's too many in the area, whatever, it should be a signal that some need to disperse. Uh, I'm not quite sure of that, but so when they when they uh, aggregate in these kind of legs, uh, so their primary aim is to be able to gain access to females, and so they're all displaying, and the females get to choose the most successful uh, male. Could be based on um, their uh, quality of display or a lot of other sexual um, characteristics, um, and, and yeah, so it, it essentially is like a mating season for them and they're competing and the ones that cannot compete, the ones uh, that do not have the desirable qu uh, qualities may not actually get to mate. Yeah. All right, so before we get into the costs and benefits of uh, maintaining and defending a territory, uh, we need to know that uh, typically the size of the territory depends on the size of the animal. If you're a larger animal, you tend to have um, um, larger territories. And also it is uh, costly because you have to spend time patrolling the larger uh, area as well. You have to be singing or displaying, uh, uh, actively advertising your uh, territory as well. And then not only, um, uh, you have to defend not only your own species, individuals from your own species, but also other species that may be interested um, uh, in the resources that are in your territory. So it's, it's, it's so there are, there are costs and benefits associated to uh, defending a territory, right? Um, and so these kind of costs would be energy uh, involved in like patrolling and displaying uh, uh, their territories, and, or it could be risk of injury when they, when they get into fights uh, with um, other uh, individuals of different territory, for example. And the benefits could be you get uh, continuous access to food and mates and nest sites and so on, right? Uh, okay, so in this plot, you can see uh, uh, territory size plotted on the x-axis and then cost or benefit uh, plotted on the y-axis. So the benefit uh, typically increases uh, over uh, territory size and then it saturates. And then the cost typically uh, slowly uh, increases and then after, after uh, a certain territory size, it exponentially increases because you have to defend a larger and larger territory and it takes more resources uh, to do that, more energy to do that. Um, so can you tell me what should be the size of the uh, territory in order for you to defend the territory instead of abandoning it in this plot? What, where, where should, uh, I'm gonna run the mouse pointer across and uh, tell me where to stop. Uh, uh, what size of the, ter what is the size of the territory that, um, that is, um, that has uh, more benefits than costs associated, the most optimum value. It's actually written there, but you could have said, yeah. So basically what, what what I'm trying to get at is that there is an optimum size at which your benefits outweigh the cost. And if you want to increase your territory more than that, it's not worth it, right? So you, at this point, what's happening here with the benefits? What are the costs uh, at this particular territory size? What are, what's the value of cost? This, right? That's the amount of cost uh, involved um, in uh, defending this 
territory of this particular size. I think it's hard because there are no numbers here. Um, but for the same territory size, the amount of benefits are really high, right? And so the benefits, the amount of benefits outweigh the cost in this case. But if you want to increase the territory size a little bit more, you might have slightly higher costs, right? But the benefit actually is saturating. So you're not really getting more benefits by increasing. So there's no point in increasing your territory size because you get more, more and more costs as it gets uh, uh, as you increase the territory size. And that's when you decide, I'm gonna stop defending this. If your territory gets bigger, so you, it's better for you to like stop defending and abandon the territory, right? And so, and, and, and also if you, for example, if you don't have enough benefits, like you don't have enough resources and your territory is really high, then that means that your costs of maintaining it are too high compared to the benefit. So it's better to abandon it than to um, defend it. Is that clear? Yes. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so I wanna give you an example of uh, uh, meat ants to show uh, how costly defense uh, can be, and, the, and so animals try to avoid the costs associated uh, with it. So these are um, what are called meat ants. So these are uh, an Australian species of ants. They eat um, meat, basically, of dead animals. They can clear up a kangaroo in like 24 hours. Uh, one colony can just go on, on, on the road. So if there is a roadkill, they can just clear up the whole thing uh, in 24 hours. And so what happens is when they go out for foraging, there may be other rival uh, uh, colonies around nearby. And so every morning when they go out, uh, they have to fight. So obviously they're, def they're, um, they're foraging in their own territory. Uh, and so they're trying to defend the food so that they, they, they get access, complete access to the food available in their territory, right? But it's expensive to, to fight because you lose a lot of these uh, worker ants. Right, so they uh, have evolved a unique display behavior, which is basically like a cat fight. So but that's what you see here. The, the, these are ants of different uh, uh, colonies and they're, they're uh, displaying, they're, they're, they're showing uh, a ritualized combat uh, moves, but they're not actively uh, harming each other. And somehow, so they do this, they're, they're two different uh, ants of two different colonies. They're doing it like a cat, cat fight kind of uh, display and they move their legs and antennae in a particular fashion. And they somehow decide who wins. They don't know how they, how they decide. One of the colonies just recedes after that uh, ritualized display uh, and the other colony. And typically the colony that recedes is the one that is invading the other colony's ter territory, so to say. Um, uh, and also, um, so in this kind of uh, 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 ritualized display, they're trying to reduce the costs associated uh, with, uh, with, uh, with conflicts, territorial conflicts. Uh, and, and these kind of, uh, not just in this example, this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, territorial defense in these defenses, uh, the payoff is uh, uh, asymmetrical. So typically the, the owners of the, the territory have more to lose than the intruder. So the owners tend to like be more upfront in, uh, in um, defending the territory. And there's also something called dear enemy effect. So if you are um, uh, individuals in neighboring territories, uh, you might show less aggression because you're, you've been encountering each other for a long time compared to an, another individual from a little bit far away uh, territory. And so um, that is also observed in some uh, animals. So it's a, it's a way to like, reduce the costs involved in defending um, uh, your territory. All right, so the other way, another way that uh, animals can um, uh, reduce aggression uh, and, and reduce some of the costs associated with defending in their own territory is to form uh, social uh, uh, groups with some uh, submission and di di uh, dominance hierarchy. Basically, you can form a group of uh, individuals like these um, wolves. Uh, where you have a social ranking. So one of them may be most dominant and then the second dominant, alpha, beta, and so on. Um, and these positions are typically learned and the top uh, ranked individual has access to most of the resources. 
And the low rank uh, individuals do not want to risk uh, combat because they have more to lose um, uh, in, doing, in doing so. But what also uh, happens is that sometimes when the, the top ranked individual needs to actively police uh, the low ranked individual, sometimes when, um, uh, when the top ranked in individual is not looking, the lower rank, the subordinate individuals may actually gain access to resources like mates, right? So they might sneak sneak up uh, and then mate, and but um, but as a response to that, uh, the dominant individual typically tends to police um, the subordinate individuals as well. All right. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Thank you. No questions. Um, all right. So. Territorial behaviors can also have a broader impact on the population of, of a species, right? So they can limit the, uh, the population de density of the species. So you can, in this uh, plot, you can see that population density is plotted um, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you have number of animals gaining access to uh, resources. The resources could be food or could be mate, right? And so as you increase, uh, so this is, this is a plot of um, number of animals that can have high quality habitat um, and, and the, the number, that number saturates after some population density, right? And, this, and similarly, this is a plot of how many an animals can have low quality habitats and, uh, and that number also saturates uh, as you increase the population density, right? And so at low population density, so if you have fewer uh, individuals in the, in the population, uh, suppose if it's, uh, the animals are birds, so these birds get access, most of them get access to high quality habitat, right? That means they, they have high quality food, high quality uh, and access to uh, mates, uh, uh, which is equally uh, available to all of them, right? And so no, none of the birds are prevented from mating in this case and all of them get high quality food. And so they can have their own little uh, territories and, uh, and if, um, they may or may not defend uh, those territories. But as you increase the population density a little bit more, um, to, so the number of individuals, so for example, when, when if you increase the population density to point A here, the number of individuals that can have high quality uh, habitat saturates at that point. So you cannot have more number of individuals having uh, higher quality uh, territories, right? And so that means that some of the individuals in the population will have to settle for low quality habitat. Is that clear, right? And so you, so the ones that are in the high quality uh, uh, in, uh, habitat might have more resources. Um, more, uh, and, and the ones that are in the low quality habitat might have less resources, but they still might get to uh, mate. Um, uh, in general, they might be able to uh, gain access to mates. Yeah, is that clear? All right, so, and if you still increase the size of the, uh, if you still increase the population density a bit more, uh, for example, to point B, what happens is that the number of individuals that can have high quality habitat has already saturated. So you can't have more number of them, right? And only some of the individuals will get to have high quality habitat. And then some of the individuals will get to have low quality habitat. But, but at the same time, even the low quality habitat is saturating at this point. So only some individuals have access to high quality habitat and very few individuals have access to low quality uh, habitat as well, right? So what happens in this case? Would, uh, what happens to, uh, um, to some individuals that cannot gain access to either of these resources? Sorry? Uh, I didn't get it. That's correct, yeah. So the, so once the animals, if you increase the population density too much, once some of the animals have occupied high quality habitat and they're defending it and, they're, and, and you can't have any more high quality habitat. And similarly, there are low quality habitats, but 
they are also occupied by uh, other individuals and there are some individuals who don't have um, uh, any resources there and she would either have to like defend you either have to fight the individuals uh, uh, who are who have occupied these two um, habitats you can either uh, fight with the high quality habitat individuals so that means you would probably be losing uh, have you would have more to lose because the individuals that have occupied high quality habitat might actually actively defend more than the individuals that are in a low quality habitat because they have more to lose right uh, and so if you're an individual who couldn't get access to either that or, or the low quality individual, your water call, uh, you'd be uh, called a floater, basically. And so you don't have access to either of the, them. If you can fight with them, you would have to fight with either the high quality habitat individuals or the low quality habitat individuals. Or if you can't do either of them, you don't get to reproduce. You don't get, you don't get to mate because mates choose, uh, if mates might be choosing the animal based on uh, the, um, the resources that the, that the animal has or the uh, physical or the sexual characters that, uh, that the animal has. Um, and so, and in a way, because these animals cannot um, reproduce, um, that weeds them out of the population. So those individuals that cannot defend uh, or that cannot fight to get uh, access to these territories are sort of weeded out of the population. And so in a way, territorial behavior can actually limit the population density of the animal um, through these kind of interactions. All right, are there any questions so far? I think we still have some more time, so I would allow more questions now before we summarize the whole lecture. So would that, that would be one reason for dispersal if uh, for some of them, they might disperse to uh, other, but they might not be able to find a mate in the, after dispersal. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the dispersal in, in a way, it typically happens when you, um, so one of the prime examples is when you're a young uh, individual and you're just dispersing away to get away from, from the same population where you are try to uh, uh, mate with other um, populations. But in this case, uh, if, they have, uh, if they don't have access to either of them, that's one of the options is to just uh, try to look for more uh, territories or more areas. But typically uh, the populations tend to be in an area where they're more successful. And so it, it might not be feasible for that animal to do it. It might not have the, um, economically feasible, so to say, the costs might outweigh the benefits in doing doing um, in doing that. Yeah. Well, they'd have to find and and uh, get accepted by another group somewhere else. If, if you didn't, then. But that's the point, right? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. If they're in that group, and in order to even go to a different group, it still involves costs associated. Uh, with going there and finding. And then again, you're not sure if you'll um, still gain access even in, in that population. It, it, yeah, it depends on so many so many variables and, and ultimately what they what might be best for them is to uh, uh, choose an option that keeps them, choose as in not actively choose but per se, but they end up um, um, going to a solution that has more benefits than costs. Um, all right. Are there any other questions? No? All right. So to summarize uh, uh, this uh, this lecture, uh, we talked about home ranges of different animals. We talked about uh, territories. So some are defended and some are, uh, home ranges are undefended typically, and territories are actively defended. Uh, we talked about ideal free distribution theory, how animals redistribute uh, in, in, a, in different patches. Uh, and we also talked about the assumptions that this uh, theory makes, for example, uh, with respect to um, uh, the animals knowing the quality of the patch, which may not always be true. So 
they may not follow the ideal pre-distribution in exploring um, their resources. And we also talked about um, uh, if the animal animals have competition, if they have social hierarchy, they may not always um, get access to uh, the resources um, um, as predicted by ideal pre-distribution. And so that basically what that means is the dominant individual might end up getting uh, disproportionately more uh, resources. They might have access to more resources compared to the, um, to the subordinate individuals or the individuals um, that could not compete, right? And so that kind of gives rise to, um, and then we, we, from there, we uh, moved on to territorial um, uh, behaviors. So, uh, um, and, 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 and also looked at the ways uh, of uh, animals advertising their territorial uh, territories. And then we looked at the costs and uh, benefits of territorial defense. We, um, uh, we learned about uh, when to defend and when to abandon uh, a territory. And uh, at the end, we learned about how uh, territorial behaviors can actually limit the population density. So they can, they can, uh, they can uh, have a huge effect on the population density of the animal. All right. Um, so again, um, so that's the QR code to give feedback. Uh, and if you um, don't want to use QR code, you can go to classtime.com and then enter this code and you can give whatever name you want. Uh, a student's name if you want to be anonymous um, and it'll take you a minute. But uh, while some people are doing that, um, are there more questions? I'd like to take questions. Yes. Um, not necessarily. So the question was if uh, uh, that uh, I mentioned that these uh, social hierarchies in the case of uh, a wolf uh, pack are learned. And if the alpha individual has a, um, has a pup, would that pup go on to become uh, an alpha individual as well? Um, uh, not necessarily. I, I think uh, it may or may not be uh, 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 in a family, it may not be inherited per se. So these are, um, so there are different ways that animals uh, decide who the uh, the dominant individual is, and, and and these this dominant individual might change over time as well. So you may see that in a lot of other um, animals as well, including uh, monkeys. So they grow, they go around in uh, um, groups. And they tend to have um, uh, fights, for example, to uh, to swap between dominant and subordinate. And so sometimes they they they, are, they risk the harm in fighting. In they fight um, to gain access. So the benefits are really high if you can gain if you can be a, a dominant individual. Why not? And if you have the energies and if you have energy to fight, uh, and if you uh, can assert the dominance. Then you can actually topple the dominant individual, and the dominant will become uh, uh, the next uh, subordinate. Or they may actually split up into two groups as well, and so they will become rival groups. And again, that's another thing that, as a group, they have to do is to um, defend their uh, defend their group. But just like individuals defend their territories, they these uh, social hierarchical groups also defend their own groups against other um, individuals as well. And another interesting thing that happens with the, some monkeys um, uh, is that if a subordinate actually sneakily mates with a female, so typically it's the dominant individual that gets access to the mate. So he's the one who uh, makes more babies in that group. But uh, sometimes when the dominant individual is not around, the subordinate might actually sneak up and then, and then they might have a baby. And so there is some, uh, and if the dominant individual can actually uh, identify that, there is a uh, uh, infanticide um, in that particular species. So they actually actively go around and kill these babies. And that some uh, uh, monkeys are actually quite brutal in that way. Um, uh, they, they, yeah, they may, they may kill uh, infants as well. This is known in, in a few other species as well. Um, yeah. 
sorry. Yeah, yeah, it happens in, in a lot of uh, animals as well, the, the infanticide, um, and just to be able to, uh, to increase your, um, um, uh, like, have um, more of your offspring compared to others. And, and, and also, it, it takes more um, resources in order to, like, if, you, if, you're, um, if you're a lion and, and, and you're, uh, you're feeding the female or you're taking care of protecting the baby, that, that's not yours, then that has more cost for you. And so in a way, um, you, yeah, in a way, it's better for you to, like, um, have your own um, offspring. That's the that's the reasoning that people make as to why they divorce it. Yeah. So, Ravi, I know sometimes with birds, if they other birds will lay the, the nest and the male will come and kill all the eggs or babies. But how how would the monkey know or uh, know that it was impregnated by uh, the sneaky uh, lower uh, rank yeah. monkey? How, um, how would you know that? Yeah, I don't <laughs> exactly know. Um, maybe they keep track of um, uh, who they mated with. Um, I don't know. Um, um, I don't know the exact um, way they would know. Uh, but I do know um, it's not exactly the same thing, but in some ant colonies, for example, there are in, uh, in some ants and some wasps, uh, they can, uh, there are some individuals that can mate. So there, there are these, uh, uh, um, um, they're not exactly princesses is not the technical term. They're, they're female elites. They can go out and mate and come back in. And so they can be more than one queen in some, in some colonies. And uh, so the queen that is uh, already there, uh, for example, take, take the wasp example. And the queen that is already there uh, uh, will actually sense the smell of the eggs that were not laid by her. Right. So they, they smell different basically. To, to her. So in the same nest, if, if another female has laid eggs and she goes around, she's always uh, going around laying eggs, right? So she smells and she eats them. Um, she eats the uh, eggs of the uh, eggs laid by the other um, um, subordinate uh, female, basically. And that's a way of asserting uh, dominance and that's a way of policing as well. And that happens in some ant species too. Any other questions? Um, all right. Um, it's 10.40. That's, that's almost time, right? All right. OK, thank you, guys. But there's one um, announcement, so stay on line. Guys, tomorrow I grade that quiz question. so. Send me topics, sign up for the presentation. There's a spreadsheet and I'm looking at it and there are lots of blank spaces still. So, um, so get that filled out. I need topics by tomorrow. Questions? Oh, the survey. I don't know, that's right. We just had the, um, sorry. What did you say? You said two questions, yeah. yeah. Questions from Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Yes? For me or for Ravi? No, no, for you. So we just have to email you about a topic and then sign up for a slot in the presentation. That's right. All right. Yep. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. Have a good uh, weekend, you guys. Bye. You too.